Well, it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm thankful for the invitation. And uh, thank you that so many have uh, made the effort to come and uh, to hear uh, the messages this afternoon. I trust that they will be a help to you. Uh, we only have a very short amount of time this afternoon to look into this uh, topic of music. Uh, we could he be here all day and still not scratch the surface. Uh, but we, uh, in this age, are presented with many questions in regards to music, and there were a few listed in the pamphlet. Uh, there are many churches being split over this issue of music today. Uh, the uh, arguments that are put forward is it's just a matter of personal taste. Uh, we are asked the question, does our choice of music really matter to God? Does it really matter what kind of music we listen to? Uh, I'm a New Testament saint. Doesn't my liberty in Christ uh, give me the freedom to choose any style of music that I enjoy? Uh, the the uh, argument that if we want to win people in this age, then we need to win them with a language they can understand. And uh, this culture has certainly embraced and is engrossed with uh, the rock genre. Should not we use this as an effective medium to reach the lost for Christ? Well, this afternoon we want to go to God's Word because we believe that that is the foundation and that is the absolute authority. And uh, we uh, would be wasting our time if you'd come here to, this afternoon to hear my opinion on music for it is worth about as much as yours. Nothing. We want to uh, seek God's mind on the matter and I trust that that is your heart's desire too. Now, verse, we're going to look at the verse this afternoon. Psalm 86, verse 11. Uh, teach, I have made it a little easy for you this afternoon and I have put all the scripture references on, uh, on the PowerPoint. We have much to get through. I don't know whether we'll make it or not. Uh, so I've tried to streamline it and get as much scripture as I can on the screen for you to, to look at. Psalm 86.11 says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. <coughs> Father, it's a blessed privilege to come together as your people this afternoon uh, to have the truth of the word of God in our presence, to know that we can rely 100% upon it, that it is uh, relevant for today, that it is life-changing today, that it has the answers for today. Uh, we pray that you would guide us into all truth this afternoon. May it be our heart's desire to understand your will and your mind in this manner of music. And may we simply lay our wills on the altar and be willing to be changed and moulded by your blessed Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Teach me thy way, O Lord. Literally, let me live in thy school. But teach me now, especially since I'm in trouble and perplexity. Uh, be pleased to show me the way which thy wisdom and mercy have prepared for my escape. This is David's, David's thinking as he, as he wrote these words. Uh, I lay aside all willfulness and only desire to be informed as to thy holy and thy gracious mind. I trust that's, that's our desire this afternoon to be instructed and informed by God's holy and gracious mind. Uh, not my way give me. Uh, Lord, uh, change me, mould me, make me into your image. Not my way, but thy way teach me. I would follow thee and would not be willful. I hope that's our prayer. To walk in the truth. Uh, when taught the truth, I will practice what I know to be truth. I won't just be a hearer, but I will be a doer of the word. Uh, truth should not be just a mere doctrine or a mere sentiment to us, but it should be a matter of our daily living. The true servant of God will regulate his walk by his master's will. As thou wilt, so shall I. The servant of God does not walk deceitfully, for God's way is ever the truth. He, it's David said, Unite my heart to fear thy name. Having taught me the right way to go, give me one heart to walk in that way of truth. Too often I feel a heart and a heart, two natures contending, uh, two principles struggling for sovereignty. And we know that a man of, of a divided heart is a weak man. 
A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, we're told in James. But to fear God is both the beginning, the growth, and the maturity of wisdom. Therefore, we need to be undividedly given up to it, heart and soul, to pursue the way of truth. And I trust that uh, that's what we want to pursue this afternoon. The wrong approach for this afternoon is, okay, I'm going to hear some things this afternoon and I'm, I'm seeking to find what music can I get away with? Okay, what music can I get away with in my library? Uh, to begin with, let's forget about what we like. Uh, let's start this afternoon by concentrating and pursuing the principles of what pleases the Almighty God. The one who saved my soul, the one who is thrice holy, what pleases Him? Ephesians 5.10 This is, I trust our heart's desire in this issue of music. It should be the, our heart's desire in every part of our lives, but specifically this afternoon we're looking at music. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. I haven't come here this afternoon to split hairs with people, uh, but simply to get us thinking according to the truth and not according to our subjective opinions or our humanistic reasoning, but thinking according to the truth of God's Word. This afternoon we want to look at God's Word, and uh, then with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I hope that we will come away having uh, come to some firm convictions within our own individual selves and our own individual relationships with the Lord as to what kind of music He would have me listen to. <clears throat> I have heard a number of different messages on the issues of music. I have spent many, many hours studying the issues of music and I still know very little of the issue of music. I have much to learn. And I don't expect that any of us here today will learn all there is to learn in the very short time we have together. I trust that it's just a continuing um, uh, teaching in your life as you seek to become the kind of uh, man or woman that God would have you be. As Christians, every part of our life is being transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the sanctification process. And it's a continuing process. And praise God, it will continue until the day of Christ. We can be confident of that in Philippians 1.6. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are told, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What a wonderful transformation. What a wonderful hope we have as believers in Christ that this is the work that God is doing in our hearts. I hope that this brings about an appetite to study the Word of God further for yourself in this issue of music. And don't think you have to be a musician to study music in God's Word. No, you don't. You just have to be a believer. Uh, you need to be in Christ and have the Holy Spirit dwelling within that He may guide you and lead you into all truth. Uh, fathers here this afternoon, we need to have a philosophy to teach our children. Uh, mothers too. We need to be able to understand the issue of music that our children will not grow up saying, why can't I listen to that? Without having a reasonable biblical answer given to them as to why that's wrong and why this is right. Teenagers, we need to be able to know uh, what it is that we should be listening that would honour uh, the Lord in our uh, personal lives. There's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, you university students, you, you other young people who are in contact with other unsaved and saved people alike, we need to know where we stand and be able to defend our position. We need to understand a biblical philosophy of music. Well, firstly this afternoon, we want to look at the... Point number one, God is a musical God. God is a musical God. It's a very part of his nature. Uh, God, I don't believe God created music because God is musical by nature. He has given us the gift of music. And we are created in his image and we are musical beings as being created in the image of God who is a musical God. Now, that's a wonderful privilege. It's a part of his very nature. 
In Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, we read, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, he will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. Our God sings. He's a musical God. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, I'm looking forward to this day and I hope I'm still here to see it. Uh, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The trump of God. God plays the trumpet. And I have a trumpet at home and um, I fill around with the trumpet, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing God play the trumpet. There is a wonderful trilogy in three major divisions of the Old Testament. This particular verse is found in history section, in the poetry section, and in the prophecy section. The first one is in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. And in the next section, in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2, in the prophecy section, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. And then in poetry, in the Psalms, we have... The Lord is my strength and song, Psalm 118, verse 14, and is become my salvation. God is the believer's strength, we read in these three verses. The Lord is his salvation, we also read. But then in these three verses we read, and it's the only time this word occurs in the Scriptures, it occurs three times in these three verses, God is the believer's song. The Hebrew word here is zimrath, and it's an instrumental term. It only occurs three times in the Scriptures, zimrath. It only applies to music itself, not to any words. But the sentiment of this verse, of this phrase, is that God is to be the music of the Christian. God is to be our song, our instrumental music. This afternoon is the Lord your song. Is he your music? During the week, on Sundays, when your mind is unoccupied, is he your song? Or does the world's music have a prominent place in your mind? Music is a very part of God's nature, and God himself is to be our song. The second point, music, God is a musical God, and music communicates. If you don't go home with anything else this afternoon, I hope you'll understand this. And it's the point of this first session, is that music is not neutral. Music itself, apart from the words, communicates. Music communicates. Well, first of all, let's look at what is music. Music is a form of communication. Uh, Christopher Hogwood said, that music is the use of sound to move the human soul. The use of sound to move the human soul. He's a famous pianist. Music has also been defined as the art of combining vocal or instrumental sounds or tones in varying melody, harmony and rhythm. Take note of those three terms. If you're not a musician, they may be new to you, but they are important building blocks of music. The melody, the harmony, and the rhythm. Music is communication. And there are different ways in which we can communicate to one another. There are different languages, if you like. Now, as for me, I only speak the English language. I could probably count about five words in other languages I can say. And they wouldn't be too good either. But I can communicate in the English language. I can also communicate in music. For music is a language. I can communicate in art. Not very good, because I'm not a very good artist. 
but there are some principles here we will quickly look at in these three forms of communication. There are building blocks, neutral building blocks in the English language. They are the 26 letters of the alphabet. We can combine these 26 letters of the alphabet in varying proportions and, and different combinations and produce a message that can become blasphemy. Or we can take those same neutral building blocks, put them together in different combinations, and they could be glorifying to the Lord. Well, the same is in art. A pen and paper in the hand of an artist can become pornography. But pen and paper in the artist can also become a beautiful depiction of God's majesty in his creation. I really appreciate art. I'm, I'm not an artist. My wife is, but I'm not. I appreciate looking at good art. But artists are just using the same neutral building blocks to communicate different messages. And it's exactly the same in music. That different proportions and combinations of notes and rhythms in the hand of a composer can become sensual music. Or it can be God-honoring music. The same neutral building blocks. <clears throat> We'd like to look at some quotes now from music professionals. These people make no claim of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. They are professionals in their field. They're sociologists, musicologists, psychologists and other, other certified professionals. Here's the first one. The Music Within You was written by two practicing and certified music therapists and instructors at New York University. They state, music is communication and communication is music. Music is a form of non-verbal communication. Music is not just a special part of life. It represents life itself. From it, we receive inspiration, excitement, and emotional enrichment. With it, we create, communicate, and express who we are. And the next one is written by Dr. Wayne Barlow, who is a music scholar. He said, the meaning of music is music itself. It is more understood than language itself. On the next one. Okay. And the next one again. There's lots of these slides to get through. I hope that you'll be able to, there's a lot of information to come this afternoon. I hope you'd absorb some of it. I'm hoping that being up on the screen will be a help to you. Since music is an emotional language and some emotions are wrong for the child of God, that must mean that some music is wrong for the Christian. In speech, we need to know the context of the language. Otherwise, it's not fully understood. If somebody gives you a statement, you think, okay, what context was that stated in? But music is much more easily understood. It transcends all cultural, all age barriers. 95% of music principles are innate at birth. The language of music has no barriers. The next quote is by, is, uh, by Gary Allen, The Sounds of Social Change. He said, A message can be carried entirely in the non-lyrical elements of music. The message can be carried entirely in the music itself. The next one is by David Tame in his book entitled The Secret Power of Music. Again, this man has no knowledge of Christ. He says, music is a form of language. Music is more than a language. It is the language of languages. There is no doubt that music actually conveys very real and sometimes very specific emotional states from the musician to the listener. Like human nature itself, music cannot be neutral in its spiritual direction. There's an unsaved man who has an understanding of the power of music. Music cannot be neutral in spiritual direction. You cannot communicate in any shape or form using a medium that is neutral. And by definition, music communicates. There is no such thing as a neutral language. World-renowned pianist, the next quote, uh, Van Cliburn. He said, the language of music is readable, 
writable and recitable. Quoted in July 15, 1994. Well, we would ask ourselves, does that which is readable, on the next slide, does that which is readable have moral value? We would say yes. If it's readable, it's communicating and has moral value. Does that which is writable have moral value? Absolutely. Does that which is recitable have moral value? Undeniably. Does language have moral value? Undeniably. Music cannot be neutral. Bach wrote music 300 years ago that still communicates with us today. My little boy Jaden, he's about six and a half months old and he goes to sleep to, to bark often. The valley sometimes. Uh, but he, he appreciates classical music. Uh, bark is communicating to my son, but bark is long gone. But he is still able to communicate through the music that he wrote. The next quote in the book, Sounds of Social Change by Gary Allen, who is a sociologist, he said, Music is now the primary weapon used to make the perverse seem glamorous, exciting and appealing. Music is used to ridicule religion, morality, patriotism and productivity, while glorifying drugs, destruction, revolution and sexual promiscuity. The next one is by Plato in 400 BC. Now that's a long time before 21st century rock music. Now he said... Let me write the songs of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. The power of music to lead a nation. Aristotle said around the same time, a person who habitually listens to the kinds of music that arouses ignoble passions, his character will be shaped to an ignoble form. In short, if a person listens to the right type of music, he will tend to become the right type of person. Conversely, if a person listens to the wrong type of music, he will tend to become the wrong type of person. The power of music, apart from the words. The next quote is by Dr. Howard Henson, a highly regarded theoretician of music. He said, music is a curiously subtle art. It is made up of many ingredients, and according to the proportion of these components, neutral building blocks... It can be soothing or invigorating, ennobling or vulgarizing, philosophical or orgiastic. It has powers for evil as well as good. The next quote is by Dr. John Diamond. In his book, he said, Music will bring down a political system faster than any revolution. Dr. Adam Knest, next quote, has a PhD. Let me read a couple of these out to you. They're not on the slide. I'll read these to you. Dr. Adam Knest has a PhD in human behaviour. He's a musicologist. He has studied the effects on music, of music on humans for many years. This is what he said. Music is a two-edged sword. It's a really powerful drug. Music can poison you, lift your spirits, or make you sick without you even knowing why. Philip Marion... He carried out a study on third world nations, just third world nations. And this is what he had to say about the music part of the culture in these third world nations. He said, there is no other cultural activity more pervasive that reaches into and shapes and moulds character as that of music. The moulder of character. Martin Luther said, whether you wish to comfort the sad, to terrify the happy, to encourage the despairing, to humble the proud, to calm the passionate, to appease those full of hate, and who could number all these masters of the human heart, namely the emotions, inclinations and affections that impel men to evil or good, what more effective means than music could you find? I miss one. That's why we're out of range. Sorry. <clears throat> we'll have to go through a few of these. Vincent, I've missed the ones ahead. Joseph Land in his book, Elevator Music. Some background music has been known to induce musicogenic epilepsy, 
triggering a chemical brain reaction that elicits thoughts of suicide or murder. Doctors had documented 76 similar cases. Music designed to soothe can be altered to torment. How? By just changing the neutral building blocks. That's all it requires. We have to go through a few. About five. These ones that we've gone through, Martin Luther and Dr. Max Schoen. Dr. Max Schoen, his book, Psychology of Music, he said, music is the most powerful stimulant known among the sen perceptive senses. The medical, psychiatric and other evidence for the non-neutrality of music is so overwhelming and unsaved men that it frankly amazes me that anyone should say otherwise. These professionals in their field do not believe that music is neutral. They have documented it, they have studied it, they have seen the effects and they have clearly indicated the power of music in their documentation. The next verse is Luke chapter 16 verse 8 and I think it is very apt in this situation. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Men and women who should know better should be able to discern the truth in this area of music have failed to discern the power and influence of music. Listen now to what secular rock musicians say that their music communicates. They are not backwards in being forwards. Stuart Goldman's confession, he said, but what are the values that rock purveys? Back in 1966, Bob Dylan told an interviewer, if people knew what this stuff was about, we'd probably all get arrested. The words rock and roll in the original patios drawn from the lingo of the blues and jazz plays of the early 50s were synonymous with the act of fornication. Lust is the main ingredient in rock music and the artists and producers who crank it out make no bones about this. Stuart Goldman was a rock musician. He made very clear what the music was communicating. Mike Quattro is a well-known producer of rock. He said, rock motivates you internally. We haven't... Sorry, we haven't got quite there yet. These are a few I've got to read to you. Rock music motivates you internally, gives you a sensual feeling. A girl can be turned on by the music. It releases her inhibitions. The beat of the drum has always been a factor. A girl realises her own lustful desires through the music. Los Angeles Times. Rock music deals with lustful ribbons lustful drives and taboo rhythms. Cheetah magazine, it's a secular rock magazine. Made this quote, if people knew what today's pop music was saying, not what the words are saying, but what the music is saying, still their words here, they would ban it, smash all the records and arrest anyone who tried to play it. John Kay, professional rock musician of the 60s, he said, we are successful in that we are able to keep the music hard and direct so that it communicates directly with the body. By carefully controlling the sequence of the rhythms, neutral building blocks, any pop performer can create audience hysteria. We know how to do it. I spoke to a disc jockey who was saved out of that environment and he uh, clearly explain to me how easy it is to control the crowd, control the audience. And he said, I had to be very careful that I did not put two violent pieces back to back because I'd send the crowd into an absolute frenzy. The power of music to control people. Look Magazine, a secular rock magazine, said it is impossible to deny that rock and roll has a sensual sound. In his book, Why Johnny Can't Tell Right from Wrong, William Kilpatrick, professor of education at Boston College, in the chapter entitled Music and Morality, he said, rock music confirms their right to have and express strong, sensual emotions. The message is your feelings are sacred and nothing is said above them. This, in its essence, is all that rock is about. Rock can't be made respectable. The music will simply subvert the words. No matter how many reforms are attempted, 
Rock will always gravitate in the direction of violence and uncommitted lust. The beat says, do what you want to do. Now we're up to him. Johnny Bristol said, 1976, sex is where he's at in music and I like it. Linda Ronstead said, debasement and obstacles is what love songs are all about. The purpose of rhythm is to get you into an orgiastic state of losing yourself. Jimi Hendrix said, you can hypnotize people with rock music and when you get at their weakest point, you can preach into their subconscious minds whatever you want to say. He died in his vomit after a drug overdose. In an interview with the famous country and western singer Garth Brooks in 1993, he was asked the question, how would you describe what you do, speaking about his music? He briefly hesitated and apologised for what his answer was going to be and just said, it's sex. John Denver, he said, rock music is a greater influence over the souls of men than primitive Christianity. Mick Jagger said, you can feel the adrenaline flowing through your body. It's sort of sexual. I entice my audience. Richard Alder, the manager of the Rolling Stones, he said, rock music is sex and you have to hit the teenagers in the face with it. Fred Mercury of the rock group Queen, he said, rock and roll is pagan and primitive and very jungle, and that's how it should be. The moment it stops being those things, it's dead. The true meaning of rock is sex aversion and style. I do deliver sex appeal. It's part of modern rock. Frank Zappa said, rock music is sex. The big beat matches the body's rhythm. David Nobleman, the legacy of John Lennon, he said, rock and roll is music pornography. Jan and Dean Berry, 1965, they, they were the early movers in rock and roll. They said the throbbing beat of rock and roll provides a vital sexual release for its adolescence. These people are not backwards in stating what their music is really communicating. It's perverse. It's sexual. It is sensual. It is fleshly. It is directly associated with the filth of this world and has its very origins in Satanism. We haven't got time to go there this afternoon, but it has its very origins in the occult. It has no place in the life of the believer. The message is hit the teenagers in the face with it. Very sadly, the stand taken by the CCM movement, the Christian Contemporary Music Movement. It's a term they've taken on themselves. It's not a term they've been labelled with. The, the, the stands taken by this group are very representative of those taken by the majority of mainstream Christianity. The whole organisation is...